Thanks, John, and uh, thanks to the audiovisual guys who I think are going to uh, hopefully keep us on track and make sure that everything's recorded tonight. I'll say a little bit more about who I am, but um, just so you are aware, uh, we did, I think, publicize the fact that we record the, the meeting tonight. Uh, so if you're speaking and you're representing anybody, if you could tell us which organization you represent when you, when you ask your question later on. Uh, but just a quick word about who I am. As I say, John um, introduced me as being part of the Consultation Institute. It's an organization that's based down in the south, uh, and we help organizations like the NHS, utility companies, local authorities, uh, to make sure that their consultation processes are as good as they can be. So I, I think it's good practice that if you have an event like this, you have somebody like me who's here to, to make sure that the, the panel answer your questions as much as they're able to, and that you give the panel an opportunity for them to answer your questions. So, um, just quickly about myself, I've been working in kind of public service for about 150 years. Uh, I was an assistant director of public health somewhere else in the country, so kind of I understand about some of the issues that, that public services are facing, but perhaps more importantly, I'm a community activist in my own hometown. Uh, I like to hold public organizations to account in the same way in which I'm hoping that you will want to ask people tonight questions and hold them to account. So that's a bit about me. Um, as I say, I think it is important that there is an independent chair um, to make sure that you feel that uh, there isn't a kind of an, an agenda on behalf of the people who are organizing this, are trying to be as open and as transparent as they can be in terms of giving you an opportunity to ask your questions. So um, we're going to have a presentation from uh, a member of the panel tonight. Uh, I've got a, a big long list of all their names and job titles, but I'm gonna do a bit of a cop out and ask them in a moment to kind of present themselves and say who they are and which organizations they're from. Um, We've got a little bit of housekeeping to do tonight, though, before we do anything. Um, apparently, we're not expecting any fire drill, um, but if we do get a, a fire alarm, we'll know about it, and there's plenty of ways to get out of the building. So there's either the way we came in through the back of the building to the, your left or your right, and the muster point for us getting back together is where we all came in the building over here. I'm assuming if you go out this way, you just follow the building round, and you'll end up back out over here, as they were not expecting anything like that tonight with a bit of luck. Uh, if people have got things like phones or uh, audio devices or anything like that, if they'd like to kind of put them to a, a stun position, a quiet position, I think that would help everybody and not kind of uh, interrupt the evening. Um, and if anybody needs to use kind of any of the facilities to take a break for themselves, they're back out through the end of the, the, the uh, room here and there's ladies on the left, and gentlemen's is a bit further down the, the uh, building, and again on the left-hand side. Okay, so um, we, are, I say we are recording the event this evening, um, and uh, well, I've, just, sorry, I've just gone through that, that piece with you, haven't I? Um, could at that, this point then I ask the um, speakers to introduce themselves? Uh, I think you've got audio mics, which should actually pick, you, pick up who you are. Just say who you are and which organization you represent. Perhaps we could start from that end. My name's John Howarth. I'm a um, general practitioner by background. I'm deputy chief executive in Cumbria Partnership Foundation Trust, which is a trust that runs most of the services outside of the main acute hospitals, including community hospitals and including Wigton Hospital. Good evening, everyone. My name is Stephen Childs, and I'm the chief executive of NHS Cumbria Clinical Commissioning Group. And the Clinical Commissioning Group is responsible for consulting on the potential changes to services that you'll have presented to you tonight. Uh, good evening, everyone. I think my uniform probably gives things away. My name is Mark Newton. I am Head of Service for Northwest Ambulance Service. I'm also a consultant clinician, and I represent MWAS on the Success Regime Board. Good evening, my name's Debbie Freak. Um, I was once upon a time also a GP, um, but I'm not practicing now. I'm a director of strategy at North Cumbria University's Hospitals Trust that runs the two hospitals in Carlisle and Whitehaven. Good evening, I'm Anna Staber. I'm the deputy director of nursing, midwifery and allied health professional and a registered nurse and midwife. I am Dr. Clive Graham. I'm a consultant microbiologist. I'm also associate medical director at North Cumbria University Hospitals. 
um, working at both the Cumberland Infirmary and West Cumberland Hospital sites. Okay. Could, I need to check whether everybody can hear everybody. Did you hear all the introductions from the panel? Is everybody okay with that? Uh, so you've heard kind of who we are. It might just be interesting for, for us to see who you guys are. Uh, I was asking somebody in the town what people from Silith call themselves, and she very politely gave me a couple of options. Is it Salonians? Is everybody a Salonian? Have we got some non-Salonians in the room? Are you prepared to say who you are? Just put your hand up if you're not from the town. Okay, so it's probably the majority, actually, by the looks of things. And can you let me know uh, if you're regular users of any of the services that we're going to be talking about tonight? So are you regularly visitors, users of either of the acute trusts? And by regular, I mean you go there more than monthly. Hands up if anybody goes kind of monthly to each, each, either of those? Visit any of those? Okay. Yeah, bit of discussion? <laughs> yeah, well, there you are. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, we're going to ask uh, John, I think, now to uh, take us through a, a short presentation. Can everybody see the presentation from where they're sitting? And when we get to the end, what I think I'd like to do, if it's all right with you, is just ask what kind of key issues, the, the kind of weight of, of interest in the room is around some of the key issues that, that John's going to raise, and then we'll make sure that we structure the kind of question and answer session on that basis. Is that all right with everyone? So over to you. Okay. Um, so what my task is, is to give you just take you through the facts of the consultation and um, um, so there's a number of slides that we'll go through and I'll um, try and just clarify and it's a really quite high level summary of, of what the success regime consultation is all about because I think people recognize what we've now um, I think the second two weeks in now into the formal Legal, legally um, constituted consultation. So we're in the consultation phase around changes in the health system. Um, some of the changes affect um, the acute hospitals, particularly uh, West Cumberland Hospital, but has uh, impacts on Carlisle. And uh, importantly, I suspect most people in this room are really interested in the, the community hospital changes, in particular Wigton. Um, so we'll answer questions quite openly uh, and straight on, on those and, and the work we're doing uh, as well. Um, so I think most people understand the challenges we have. Uh, we, we, we have slides for people who live in rural communities. We have slides to tell people we live in rural communities. I've lived here for 33 years now. And um, um, so we've got real geographical challenges. We don't get any extra money for that, really, in this health system. So um, we cover um, the, the population density in, in Cumbria is uh, 74 per square kilometre. And places like the Solway Plain is much less than that. Eden Valley is probably quite similar to Eden Valley. Eden Valley is 24 per square kilometre. If you go to Blackpool, it's 4,000 per square kilometre. If you go to Islington, where most of policy makers and politicians live, it's 18,600 people in every square kilometre. So we've got real challenges around our um, geography, delivering services across this geography with people having to move for care a lot of the time. Um, we've got um, quite significant, so most of the disease groups, you know, cancer, heart disease and others, are uh, overall in Cumbria. It's higher than national average. And obviously, there are some coastal areas, particularly along this west coast, where there are significant pockets of deprivation and very high uh, prevalence rates. Prevalence is uh, ever, ever very high um, uh, challenges with high rates of, of, of disease. Um, we've got... Um, we're going in the wrong direction in terms of admitting people to hospitals. So in North Cumbria... Uh, there, there's been a 20% increase in hospital admissions over the last two years. Um, so, and th there's a national issue. The national, nationally, demands going up and, and the hospitals uh, um, uh, are getting very pressured. Um, there's a slide later that will tell you how much overspent we are, but we have a real challenge. We're being challenged as part of the success regime. Uh, about our, uh, our overspend. So it's about £70 million this year. Um, 
and that's why we have a success regime. A success regime, I think people have, have understood this, um, it, it's, there were three areas in the country which had a national intervention, and North Cumbria was one of them. And it's, and it's brought in all partners in the system, so my trust, um, the, the, the commissioning side, uh, our acute trust colleagues, into uh, this process to try and find better um, 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 ways of, of managing the whole health, health economy. Um, and there is, there's been, particularly historically, some quality challenges, um, uh, which are a lot, uh, a lot of credit to our, I don't work in the acute trust, but um, our acute trust colleagues have done a huge amount of work and seen the mortality rates come right down in, in the uh, local hospitals. But several years ago, they were, they were high, and that triggered a lot of concern, and there have been concern around other, other services as well. So it, it's fair to say that, and I live here, and I've lived here all my life, I've, uh, my family are here, we are struggling as a health system. We're struggling with recruitment in particular, um, um, which goes across every sector. So a recruitment in general practice is really struggling with recruitment. Uh, so when, when there's a national problem with recruitment, Cumbria gets it worse in terms of health healthcare recruitment. So uh, real issues around um, um, recruitment in general practice in Copeland, one in four GP, GP uh, posts are vacant at the moment or, or covered by locums. Um, uh, uh, big recruitment um, challenges in, for paramedics, for um, our community teams. Um, so in our community hospitals in August, there was um, overall a 39% vacancy rate or, or of qualified staff, RGN staff, so that's a qualified nurse. And it's despite huge efforts around uh, recruitment, consuming many people's time, your know, whole time, trying to actually solve these recruitment problems. So um, the success regime set up to try and tackle some of these issues, uh, to bring us together as an economy and try to tackle it. Uh, and for people who know me, there's a number of people in the audience I, I do know, um, that we can't tackle this as a health system and just give the solutions to uh, the public. We have to work in partnership. And so the consultation, if we want it to be genuine, is a listening, a proper listening, genuine uh, event. So we, very, we don't have to agree with anything, but what we need people to do is to feed back into the, the, the process. Um, what we want to do, and we already do, I, I actually say when we, we, um, people would use this slide, we already do a lot of this. We want to be a real... Um, place for excellence of rural uh, and remote health care. So the, this challenge is, uh, I spent the day in a workshop with doctors from Newfoundland um, in Canada talking about the new medical school at campus that's opening up in Whitehaven. Very, very exciting stuff. And um, I think we do a lot of this already, but we need to really build on that strength. A lot of the practices around here do, do really excellent uh, remote and rural um, care for, for, the, for the dispersed communities. This isn't really part of the consultation. The, the, um, the, it, the consultation encompasses all the pathway changes, particularly the, the bed changes, the, the changes around stroke and so on. The biggest part of the, the new strategy that's evolving is how we build health, the health from, from communities upwards. So, the, and this is what we, uh, a little bit of jargon, but this is what we're calling our integrated care communities, where we work as integrated teams at a local level. Uh, and I, I, I think this is, in fact, is as important, if not more important, than many of the other aspects of, of, of what is in the overall strategy. Um, built up from GP practice lists to give populations what we want to do is to create integrated teams that work with communities and we build improved health on a local basis. Because we moved, we need to bring more and more care local in, in, um, in, in our model. Uh, I was in Maryport uh, last week and we were modeling how many people leave Maryport every year for health care for an appointment at the hospital. It's 27,000 people every year move out of the town. And it will be the same in the Solway Plain, lots and lots of movement. So 
whole idea of this is to bring more and more care locally and to try and uh, reduce movement uh, overall. Um, the, the, the bulk of that movement are, uh, 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 is actually for outpatient appointments. Um, so in, in Maryport, 22,000 people move every year out of the town for an outpatient appointment to get a specialist opinion. You think, well, you know, in the modern day, there must be a better day, way of doing that. Okay, so these, I'm going to run very quickly and quite high level through the main changes that are proposed in the consultation document. Um, so the first is, I suspect for people who live in this area, these probably don't impact on yourselves as much as it does if you lived on the West Coast. Um, so uh, there was a review and a consultation around uh, children's services that set out each of these processes set out a number of options. They went from a long list to a short list, and then within that, there is a preferred, um, preferred option. Um, and um, the, the uh, preferred option for, for children's services, option one, that uh, they keep inpatients at uh, both CIC and West Cumberland Hospital, but a, a lower risk group at West Cumberland Hospital to, to concentrate most of the very high intensity care at uh, Cumberland Infirmary. In maternity services, um, um, again, a number of options were considered. The uh, preferred option that is in this, uh, the consultation document, but the, the, at the back of the consultation there are forms and really um, the point is to get feedback because the success regime cannot make decisions legally uh, at the moment. There cannot be of any pre-agreed uh, pre decision on this and it's legally obliged to take in the feedback from, from the public in making those de decisions. So it's very important to feedback. So that, but the, uh, the preferred option there is a midwife-led unit at West Cumberland Hospital with um, a selected low-risk births going uh, in, into that. It's what they call a standalone midwife-led uh, unit. And uh, so it would need, mean uh, a, a, number, a significant number of, of, of women in West Cumbria traveling to Carlisle uh, for, for the delivery. Community hospital inpatient beds, there were, num again, a number of options set out, and um, the options, that w the preferred option is that in that was to consolidate onto six sites, and within the document it talks about the removal of beds from Alston, Wigton, and Maryport which will probably be, the, I will guess, one of the main um, topics for discussion as to how we got to that and what we're doing and uh, the conversations we're having uh, about that as well um, with the local uh, community. Emergency and acute care, again, a lot of work uh, modeling on this, uh, but it's quite clear and uh, it's a quite clear statement from the success regime um, that there will be a 24-7 A&E at West Cumberland and at CIC with um, ongoing medical care there. But in West Cumberland, it will need quite an innovative model of, of how you staff it and model it because to get the traditional model of uh, registrars and senior house officers, you know, that sort of uh, model that's been there since the start of the NHS probably doesn't work for uh, Whitehaven, we're going to need to train many more specialist nurses up to very high levels, which are already uh, doing uh, to sustain the, sustain the care. Stroke services, and this is called hyperacute stroke services. So this is really talking about what happens when you have your stroke now. Uh, so hyperacute means the, the initial phase, rather than the, the prolonged rehabilitation that many people need after stroke. And um, uh, there's a clear proposal in the success regime that there is a, a, a people with a new stroke um, move uh, and are treated in a, a dedicated unit at Cumberland Infirmary. The reason for that is the on, onset of clot-busting drugs that used to be just for heart attacks are now used for strokes. And, there's a, and we need to get people there quickly, so it's very important for people to not sit on symptoms that might be a stroke because there's now a window of four, four and a half hours, I think it is, uh, to, to get uh, stroke clot treatment, uh, clot busting treatment. 
so that just to, this is I think the last slide, which is um, talking about the money. Um, it is about the money, but it's about the quality and it's about improving a better system to improve the overall health. So it's all, all those things really. So um, the, uh, I mentioned the overspend now is about 70 million pounds. If we do nothing, and of course we're not going to do it, it we, there's no scenario really that we'll do nothing. But if we did nothing and just sat and waited for it to get worse, it'll get dramatically worse. Um, we've, be, um, we've modeled how we can make changes. Um, the, um, the, some of the changes to the pathway changes and the bed changes in the community hospitals actually don't contribute or contribute very little to the overall picture and they are much more about um, sustaining the services um, and staffing um, and most of the uh, savings will come from um, um, much more integrated working and the standard each trust so like, trust like mine have efficiency savings to take costs out every year and we've been doing that for years now uh, or it seemed like years it is years in fact I think uh, so, um, again, I think um, West Cumberland Hospital, um, the, um, the messages there are, there actually are some things returning to West Cumberland Hospital. Uh, so, uh, several years ago, two or three years ago, there were quite a lot of pathways like acute trauma transferred, and there's good evidence that people have done well out of that to go into a, a, Carlisle, but the idea is to uh, bring some of that more minor trauma, trauma surgery back to West Cumberland, uh, some more uh, um, minor acute surgery back, um, and more planned surgery back. There's an awful lot of people travel from Whitehaven to Carlisle for routine op planned operations, and, and you, know, you could make Whitehaven much busier just by repatriating some of that um, um, so the, the, you know, as a positive within the challenging messages, there is a positive message about bringing back a lot of stuff that has uh, gone to Carlisle already, uh, and a major new diagnostic suites planned. So um, people don't always believe that no decisions have been made. Um, I sit on a lot of these meetings, and I wouldn't get involved in it if I thought that decisions had been made. Um, um, I think we need to genuinely listen to what people say during this. And um, so these are a set of proposals. Uh, it's not 100% that each of these will go forward. So they, it, it, it is potentially influenceable by um, uh, really good ideas, constructive, positive ideas. And we've been beginning to do some work with, in Wigton, for example, uh, Evelyn, uh, he is nodding, and um, in Maryport and Alston on different, uh, uh, trying to get better solutions uh, uh, to, to, to the one uh, that, that, that's uh, proposed. And those will be considered if, if we come up with good proposals, so they have to uh, meet the criteria and, and the challenges we have, um, then they will be considered um, as part of the consultation. So the decisions are, um, I think the, there is a process, I think, till mid-December, I think it is, I'm looking... Uh, I think it's mid-December the consultation um, is going to go on until, and then there'll be an analysis of all the findings that's going to, the, 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 we expect hundreds, probably well, thousands of responses. Um, there'll be an analysis and a process between December and, and March um, to, to look at all that, and decisions made in the, uh, sometime in the spring, I, I, I anticipate. Um, um, so that's the sort of facts. That's, I'm, I'm trying not to present it as you know, my preferred options or anything. Those are the facts that have uh, come out of all the workshops and the work that's been done in the uh, success regime. So I'll, I'll pass back for questions. Okay. Okay, thanks very much. Um, obviously, I'll hand over to the panel in a minute. and just, I'll just remind you of where they come from. But in terms of representing a group of people who are responsible for buying services on your behalf and providing services on your behalf um, and delivering patients quickly when we need to get to hospital quickly and to the ambulance service. Um, there's a great panel here, so I want you to use them as much as possible. Just before we do that, can I just check, uh, how many people have actually seen the consultation document? Okay, because if you haven't, there's big piles of them at the back there, and it'd be really great if you could take one or even more away with you. I think there's quite a lot. 
and I think it would help us if you took more away and we didn't have to take them home again. Um, as Mark was saying, I think it's really, really important for something like this that as many people as possible have their say. Public meetings like this are one way in which people can have their say. Mailing back the consultation questionnaire is another. Anybody visited the website for the consultation? Did we know that there is a website for the consultation? Would it help if we shout out what the web address is? Oh, look at that, as if by magic. Uh, if you go on there, I think you'll be amazed at the amount of data and information that's on there. I would say quite a lot of that information is difficult to navigate your way through, and I know that the organizations who are kind of consulting at the moment are looking to ways in which they can improve that information to make some of the information more accessible to you. Uh, We've, talked, we've heard about, kind of, I think, five main areas that are involved in the consultation. Just as a, as a show of hands, uh, which areas are you kind of particularly interested in tonight to make sure that we, we kind of cover that properly? So are we going to get many questions around kind of children's services? Uh, maternity? Children's services? One for there. Maternity? Uh, community hospital beds? Okay, there's your favorite. Uh, the emergency and acute care and hyper stroke services. Okay. Well, you're going to be busy, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> you're determined to stay quiet. Okay. See how you get on with that. So, can I just remind you of who's here? You've got the ambulance trust, you've got the acute trust in numbers. So make sure you work them particularly hard. You've got the Clinical Commissioning Group, who is the organization that buys services on your behalf. And you've got the Partnership Trust, who are part of the organization that's behind Healthcare for Future for the north and east of Cumbria. OK, why don't we go with, and we'll mix it all up, who wants to start off with a question around uh, the reprovision of community beds? I think a few of you had your hands raised a moment ago. And what we'll do is we'll, we'll well, there's a roving mic, if, if people are happy to use that microphone so that w it isn't just about making your voice heard, it's about recording as well, if you remember. That's why we're asking you to use it. There's a lady at the back there. Yeah. Well, it's for recording purposes, so that's why we need you to use it, if that's all right. Okay. It's just, uh, you, you said there is 70 million deficit in the budget. And I would like to ask how much of the 70 million deficit goes interest rate for the PFI. So hospitals have to pay the loan before they can recruit nurses or doctors or take beds away from the, this area. OK, so there's a question around the kind of financing of yes. one of these options. Is there anybody else that's got a question around the, the kind of financing aspect of this? Is, that, is it the same question? That's about the same, yes. OK, anybody else got that? can just clarify the, the position about the PFI, how it's being paid off, because it's always used in whenever money comes up. We've always got this albatross <laughs> around our necks. So if you can clarify how that's sorted, thank you. Okay, is that all right? Are you happy to take that? Over to you. Um, I'm not the director of finance and I'm certainly not an expert in a PFI, but I can give you the, the, the high level answer to that. So the PFI repayments that we have to make are in the order of six million-ish. Excuse me if I haven't got that exactly right. Um, however, we get reimbursed by the government for those payments that we have to make over and above. So um, I, it is a red herring. Um, there are lots that we can say about the PFI, about it was um, one of the very, very first nationally. Um, so people were cutting their teeth, and there's lots of different views on how well PFI works as a model anyway. Certainly, there have been difficulties with how the contract's been um, framed right from the beginning, and we're working very closely with our PFI partners to try and overcome some of those difficulties, which have caused friction between us, but now we're actually working very cohesively. But the important thing to say and remember is that the PFI is not the reason why we have got financial difficulties in this area. Absolutely not. There is a pressure, but that pressure is met by central government in recognition that otherwise it would affect us. 
Stephen, did you want to add anything? Thank you, yes. Um, I think it's entirely appropriate we, that we are absolutely transparent with you about the financial context to our health economy. But I wouldn't want anyone in the room to think that the changes, the potential changes that we're consulting upon uh, are designed to recoup that overspend. The financial impact of these changes is relatively small, £2 million a year. The, the bigger issue... Um, is the quality and the safety of the services that we're trying to provide. I think that's just a, a really important point to bear in mind. Okay, does that... You were saying it was an elephant in the room, and the answer was it's not actually relevant to this consultation. It's a... It's a, it's a red herring in the it's room. It's a red herring, I think <laughs> you said. Did that... You, you were trying to connect it specifically to the community beds issue. Do you think that's an answer? I mean, the six million you mentioned, is it per year or per month? That's per year. That's for the acute trust. So the partnership trust in, has also got um, a PFI deals. I wouldn't be able to answer about their own PFI, but it's been the one at Carlisle that I know has been the subject of much attention. But as I say, it's a, it, it, it is a red herring in that, in that regard. Yeah, well, I think this amount of money that is going to the PFI is if it is available for the small hospitals, communities like Wickton and that you are trying to close down, I think it will make a, a big difference. That money comes specifically with the tag that is supported from the central government specifically to support the PFI because otherwise we wouldn't have a hospital there. So it, it's not locally available money to reinvest. So can't we ask the government to take over this amount of loan that these hospitals can, can I think uh, sorry effectively I think the government already has done that because they gave extra money to the health economy yes. for the PFI um, which if it got solved as a problem we wouldn't get that extra money so what it doesn't do is impact on those figures that we've got. Uh, do you see what I mean? Because I think, the, as far as I understand it, um, the, the, the government already gives additional funding to the trust to cover that PFI in recognition of the fact that it's... You know, uh, That's quite, uh, absolutely uh, correct, which stops us then having to um, make any changes that could affect um, other services. That, that pressure is met. There seems to be some kind of nodding in the room that there's, you, you're content with that answer in terms of it, it's, it's not something that specifically pertains to this consultation. Is that all right? right. Can, can we move to something else in relation to the, the, the inpatient beds? I'm sure there was further questions that people had. There's a lady there. How is um, closing the community hospitals going to help with the bed blocking that we now... Okay, I'm going to try and answer that. Um, the, perhaps it would help if I, um, there was a process that went on, sorry, I'm, I, I know you can't see me. Um, there's a process that went on during the success regime, a number of workshops um, um, that different clinicians came in, some members of the public, and they went through, um, it was quite a sort of mapped and planned process to, to look at a, a number of different issues, um, one of which was... Um, the overall number of beds that we should have in the community hospital system. Second was to look at the, um, where we are, how we staff them and the staffing models. Um, and the third was to look at the buildings. Um, um, so in that, in that process, so that started, starting with the overall number of beds, we've got overall in North Cumbria 133 community hospital beds. Now these beds are what they call intermediate care beds. So they sit between the acute hospital and general practice primary care. So they're in that middle bit. Now, everywhere in the country has got some sort of beds in that middle bit, in the intermediate care bit. One of the things that's very unusual about Cumbria is that the vast majority of our beds are in community hospitals in that bit. In other parts of the country, they'll be in care homes and nursing homes or provided in different ways. So we've got a bit of a different, uh, different model. The, the people who worked on this looked at the average beds that people have for our population, and that would give us about 102 uh, beds, and we've rounded that up uh, to 104 for a reason, I'll, I'll tell you. So if you said, what, you know, looking around the country, how many beds should we have in that middle tier for North Cumbria, the answer was 102 
Um, now, in the proposal, the proposal changes uh, to change it to 104. Um, since 2013, um, I, I care passionate about community hospitals. I worked in one as a doctor for 20 years. I'm on the National Council for, committee for no, the Community Hospitals Committee, even the NOS. I, I, I led the campaign to keep them open uh, in 2009. So I actually care, and our trust has sort of looked after these hospitals. We, we, we do like them, and uh, uh, people have heard me say this, but I reckon some of the best care in the NHS goes on in these hospitals. And if there's any staff, I don't know whether there's any staff in the room, it's really outstanding care. The problem, uh, particularly if you come and look at it from outside, uh, we've got five hospitals in Allerdale for uh, a population that, if you look nationally, we, we seem to be massively overbedded. Um, the, in the staffing side, um, since 2013, despite, uh, and so way, way before the success regime was ever um, imagined um, by politicians, um, um, we've been struggling to staff them. And that's, um, you know, it's just beginning. So um, I was looking back to when Wigton had its full beds, and it's, ye it's several years before we've been able, uh, since we've been able to staff them. The vacancy rate in Wigton last month, in, in August, sorry, was 32% for trained nurses. The, um, in Maryport, it was 70%. So we've got real problems of recruiting, um, despite... Uh, uh, intensive effort. So there's, there's significant staffing issues. So the numbers of beds have varied since 2013. They've not been 100. They've very, I can't remember a time when they've been 133. Um, so they've been down to, uh, so the last six months, 12 months, they've been bouncing around at 110, 115. July, there were actually 104 beds that we could staff to keep open, which is the number that's in the, in the proposal. The third thing that came into the mix, um, and I'm not defending the, the I'm just explaining the, the process. The third thing that came into the, uh, the mix was an analysis of the buildings, because whilst it's not about money, the, one of the things that really does impact us is um, ability to get uh, capital money for any new builds and new spend, uh, new, new, new buildings, um, um, sadly. Um, I think that's uh, the situation. So as part of the analysis, they looked at the different buildings. And the, the Wigton Hospital, as you know, is the oldest hospital um, um, with a very long history of fantastic service. But we're the oldest hospital. And in our, from our estate's point of view, is the one that with the most challenges. Um, uh, are lots of, you know, at some point in the very near future, it will need very significant investments, millions, or reprovading um, um, so uh, that's how the process went to get to 104 beds, rightly or wrongly. Um, um, and within, and, and I think Wigton in particular was affected by the building state and the fact that would, you know, if you look forward, at some point soon it will need a major reinvestment, and that uh, weighed against Wigton. Unfortunately, in the current ways, uh, rightly or wrongly, in the current ways of. Um, the current state of the, the, the system and, and cash availability. Um, I, I can explain a little bit in, in a minute some of the other work we're doing with the uh, leagues of friends and so on locally to try and work our way through, find if there's any better answer or we can think, innovate or think a bit laterally or think about the wider beds in the system. Uh, staff get the, the staff now. Yeah. How are you going to staff more people get the stuff for the care, well, because the, if you go back to the 1990s, yeah. the Royal College of Nurses actually said this was going to happen and nothing was done about it. Yeah, I, so I, why I agree. So why do governments not listen to the people who uh, are in the I job? Couldn't, I couldn't agree more. It's the same for doctors as well as being uh, sort of, it's we're going predicted. Up, we've, we've gone off a cliff in terms of recruitment. But, and but the, governments and don't listen to the people who are no, doing I, the job. I agree. And... Um, Perhaps I shouldn't agree in that standing on a public platform, but I do agree. <laughs> uh, because, um, um, and one of the, th uh, the things, sorry, the thing I didn't mention, I hope you don't mind, because it's, it's probably most people are interested in community hospitals. Uh, the thing I didn't mention was the, uh, the new guidance around the staffing ratio, which was a very significant. So we were struggling, and then there came a new guidance on, uh, on uh, staffing ratios for nursing. Uh, nursing which meant we had to invest significant amounts in additional staffing 
in community hospitals, and it triggered vacancies because we couldn't re recruit. But that was a one um, trained nurse for every eight patients, and it, go drift to, it goes to one in 12 at night. Now, there's a lot of debate as to should community hospitals be staffed the same as older people's wards in, in uh, hospitals. Well, we did a lot of work on that, and we got experts to come in and look at the dependency, which is how much nursing care people need, and the acuity, in other words, how sick they are, and it's very similar in our community hospitals. And most uh, people who work there will, will agree with Nod, uh, I would guess, to older people's wards in, 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 in ho hospitals. So there is a lot of evidence that if you staff a ward properly, you get fewer falls, fewer pressure ulcers, much better care and compassion, better uh, attention to your nutrition and feeding and so on. So we, we have adopted those standards and we, we're quite firm on why, because it's a quality, um, well, but it does put us under more pressure in terms of uh, staffing them. And that's why the modeling goes to multiples of eight. So 104, that's why it's 104, not 102. It's, it's a multiple of eight. So ideally, we want um, to model our units um, uh, around multiples of eight. I still don't understand where you're suddenly going to get these nurses from to work into the community. Well, um, uh, no, I don't them. think we are going to suddenly... Get, uh, I don't think this is going to per completely solve our... Um, uh, problem, but we've got some small units, for example, uh, Alston, uh, um, with, with its six or seven beds, um, very, very, very vulnerable to sudden sickness and uh, va uh, vacancies. And it's also quite challenging for newly qualified nurses to come in and be the only nurse on the ward. And you're not only the only nurse on the ward, you, you don't have medical backup like you do in the hospital. You know, you, you've got Chalk, uh, who uh, cover and could, there could be quite a time to to arrive or the ambulance service of, uh, of course so um, um, so the the um, by consolidating down to the this is the thinking um, right or wrong uh, by consolidating down to fewer sites we'll um, be able to use the staff and get bigger units that actually can be more robustly staffed and we can keep to the quality standards. Uh, so that's the idea, but it won't solve our problems. So there will still be challenges even if we consolidate it down to six sites. John, just to give you a break for a second, and um, to see, make sure we give everyone else a chance to kind of ask a question around this. But I know one of the other panel members was just going to put this in a bit more context as well, because I think there's a broader strategy yeah. behind the work in the localities, isn't I it? just wanted to bring people back to um, what John talked about when he was presenting his slides about the integrated care communities. We see those very much as the absolute foundations of what we, we are trying to achieve. We know, in the same way as you talked about bed blocking um, in relation to the acute hospitals, we know that people aren't necessarily in the right places for what they need. It's not actually good for people to be in acute hospitals, and it's not great for them to be unnecessarily in community hospitals or even go into residential and nursing care. And a lot of what we are trying to do is to stop this massive reliance on beds and ensure that people can be where they want to be within their own homes with their family around them and not um, in, a, in a bed that is inappropriate. There are times when beds are absolutely appropriate and that's why all the modelling that John's talked about reflects what we actually need. But we want to do much more in the integrated care communities to stop patients, stop patients, stop people getting unwell in the first place, much more about prevention, about management of people's long-term conditions that stops them becoming unwell. When they do become unwell, not necessarily needing to go into hospital because there's strong community teams joined up across health and social care and primary care who can help manage people with subacute conditions in their own homes. Um, if they do need to go into hospital, then making sure that they are able to make a swifter recovery as they can with really good discharge planning across all of the partners to get patients back home wherever possible into community hospitals where a period of rehabilitation may be needed or into another form of respite um, care. But generally what we're seeking to do is to get people well enough to be back at home and independent. That's our aim and we must keep focused on what we expect the, community, the integrated care communities to deliver. It's a model that's been successfully delivered in other parts of the country all across the world and we need to learn from them and really build up these communities. 
I'm being a bit of a rubbish chairman. I've only just noticed that there's a colleague here with a hand up. Could you hold on one second so we can just get the mic? Thank you. I would like to know how this integrated care community is going to be funded and who's actually going to be managing it. I um, work at a GP practice and practice manager, and there's a lot of talk going on at the moment, but not a lot of action, and I just don't want everything to be pinned on these integrated care communities when we haven't got any leadership upon it at the moment. Yeah, I'm possibly not the best person to answer this. Neil, perhaps, or, or John. Um, um, really good question, and I think it's quite a good analysis of where we're at with these. Um, they, they're, they're, there are, um, I think what we've got is a concept that's been around for a long time of working together in partnership on a local place-based level, and we've never really fully operationalized it. Um, um, there are uh, a number of uh, sites like working to, and we've got Dr. McGreeve in the room, uh, where um, who are have been in a new, the first wave of trying, and they have a dedicated um, uh, uh, staff uh, band aid, I think, staff member uh, uh, dead, uh, purpose to try and work and help lead it. Uh, but it's about really building a partnership, a leadership team rather than a, le uh, a leader. In terms of funding of it, well, there are, you know, those posts are funded and, you know, there's a rollout of, of, of this, but really the funding has to come from, we have to re redirect care more and more and more back, to, uh, back into communities. And we have to have a system that uh, actually allows money to follow that. Um, so there's lots of discussions more uh, at the highest level about how the big trusts and the partners with social care and everybody works together in, in a much more integrated way because the current system of paying for admissions, uh, the current system is um, you pay every time somebody goes to an outpatient appointment there's a, or a &E or admission, there's a payment goes with it um, and they come to primary care, general practice or to community teams, there isn't a payment to it, there's, you just get paid a certain amount every year and it doesn't matter how so, it's sort of a perverse incentive in a system design. So we look, we'll be looking at that over the next 12, 18 months as to how we can work together in much better partnership arrangements to spend the money more. Is, is there something behind the question in terms of whether or not money's being recycled into this? Is that what you're asking? It's just where the, really where the money and the funding is going to come to help towards this patient pathway that you're wanting us to create um which i think is absolutely brilliant that we, you know down at that level we have some sort of control but there needs to be funding there for us to be able to get the nurses out to the community out into the patient's home so that they're looked after i know that's one of the areas we're looking at as a, as i mentioned the 20 percent increase in emissions over the last two years to the hospital and that's take you know so if if we get we've got to get admissions down again to where it was um, and redistribute that money back into um, locally, lo you know, reinvest some of the savings, not all the savings, there's a big deficit, but part of the savings back in, in primary and community setting. The wider success regime business case that sits behind this makes it very clear the, the, the shift of care, but we need to do that together as well. It, it sort of doesn't work in opposition, it needs to be in partnership with acute trust colleagues and. Uh, other colleague, you know, we need to work together to build the out-of-hospital model and strength as multi-specialty, multidisciplinary primary care working together. Um, uh, if you see what I mean, uh, rather than who, whose job is it to push the, the ICC, though? You know, to get everybody together to get talking. Right, uh, there's there's um, a re-energising of this process. Uh, my chief is Claire, uh, Claire Malloy sits. Uh, with the other chief execs, and um, the, there's a new, uh, a, a newly formed leadership group for that that's just starting to try and re-energize this whole process. I'm assuming that everybody's equally fascinated by this, but I, but I, I wonder whether this is slightly outside of the kind of scope of the, the consultation areas that we're talking about tonight. So I just want to make sure everyone gets a chance to ask what they want to ask. If this, if this is part of what you want to talk about, that well, you know, we need to keep it going. I think Stephen was going to come in. Yeah, I, you, you're right. It's, it's not technically part of the consultation, but it's terribly important context. Yeah, absolutely. And it's why it's, it's why it's there on one of the slides. It's why it's referred to 
in the consultation document. And you know, there are so many links with some of the things we've been talking about tonight. Recruitment, for example. We, we're talking about creating this exemplar for the provision of care in remote and rural communities. And the integrated care communities are absolutely integral to that. I think it would be wrong of us to come out and present this is how it's going to be, because <laughs> equally important is that all of those that will be involved in the delivery of the ICCs need to play a really big part in creating it. And primary care has to be right at the heart of that. Um, it, as with all the other partners that are on, around this table today, of course. Um, so it's important not to rush into it. There, there is a, a pace and an urgency to putting this together. Um, but, but the solution, the pathways, um, all that goes behind the title ICCs needs to be owned by all of those health and social care agencies that, would, that need to play into it. Um, and we have two GP colleagues here today um, who, who, who may well want to just add a little. Yeah. Uh, and everybody, does everybody know that the Clinical Commissioning Group is an organisation of GPs? Yeah, so, so kind of Stephen sits on top of that. But I say there's colleagues here that will give you a, a kind of feeling from the grassroots along with colleagues here. Um, I'm Neil McGreevy. I'm a GP um, down the coast in Workington. And I've been working, um, I suppose, on behalf of the GP, CCG to try and develop the concept of integrated care communities. And just to address your question um, a bit more specifically about the money, I think ICCs will only be successful if they move work out of secondary care into primary care, but the money has got to move with them. And it may be there has to be some seed funding initially to start that off. And, th and then it would pay for itself. Anybody else? Are you wishing to say anything? Um, my name's Colin Patterson. I'm a GP in Carlisle. Um, we have got one of the Vanguard ICCs starting up in urban Carlisle. Um, there are different models. Um, and Neil's looking at joint working among practices in Workington. Um, in Carlisle, we have gone for a large merge practice um, so, um, we've got a large management resource and we're allowed now to develop more clinics and new ways of supporting people who are housebound and chronic disease management because there are more people in the team um, and we've got one administration team and then we'll have one team to interact with our colleagues in the acute trust, the ambulance trust and uh, the partnership trust. Um, so. Uh, we're having to go through changes in the way that we do our general practice. It's very difficult, it's very challenging. Um, it's just been happening for a week and a half and I need a big lie down because <laughs> it's not been easy. There's lots of bumps. But one of the things it's shown me is if three practices joined together, had three so many different ways of doing it, how on earth were people outside, patients, other agencies, supposed to relate to all of us in our three different ways? And I think that really it's a long, hard look in the mirror to say, I worked in Brunswick House, it really suited me. But actually, how much did it suit what people needed? And how much did it suit those who had to work with me? I was doing hunky-dory, but it wasn't necessarily working well for everybody else. And I think it's that long look in the mirror and actually taking the plunge, because it would have been the easiest thing in the world not to sit down with three other practices and have our disagreements which we had to work through, um, like how the buildings were going to be paid for, um, like how our managers were going to end up managing as one team, like how GPs were going to relate to other GP colleagues. I know you all like watching soaps. Well, you'd love to have been a fly in the wall when we were having those discussions. Oh, what's he saying? What's he doing? Um, I think it's difficult to realize how we all have got so tied up in our own little world um, and some of the things that we have to do with our colleagues is we've got to open up. And I, that journey is going to be really, really difficult. So when our colleague here says, I can't see how it's going to work, um, or it's not clear at the moment, yeah, yeah. That, there's one word that will come out, and that's going to be painful. It's going to be difficult. Um, because I think unless we're outside our comfort zone, we're not doing what we have to do. Um, and for instance, just to give you an example of some of these schemes that we've been working, there's the ambulance pathfinder scheme. So if you suddenly had uh, something go awry with you in Sillith and the ambulance was called, the question would really be, do they have to take you the whole way to the infirmary or can they talk to a GP? 
and see if we can deal with this thing in Silith and not have to take you the whole way to the a and &E and deal with it here at home. Well, we have to work hard to get the Pathfinder going. Uh, so if, there's no use saying, oh, the GP will call back the ambulance crew in the next three hours. We have to get a way to get back to the ambulance crew in the next sort of 10 minutes. I'll give you 15. Yeah, okay, <laughs> he's giving me some slack. Um, and that meant we had to change the way we worked our duty doctor roster so that when a message came through, the paramedic needs to talk to the doctor. Um, somebody at home needs some input to help keep them at home. We had to change the way we worked. And that's just one example. I could go through other examples um, for our colleagues um, in the hospital. I've been working on cancer pathways, about how we can try and get more people to survive their cancer and get to the hospital quicker. We all had to sit down. We all had to say, what's wrong with this cancer pathway? It was really difficult. And now I'm visiting practices in Carlisle to say, you know what, we need to change a little of what we do at the start of this pathway to give the hospital a really good chance to get to the 62-day target. Why is that important? Because if you've got a cancer, we want to operate on that. We want to diagnose it within a month. We want to operate within a month. Why? Because you get a better outcome. And that means more people are going to survive cancer. I've just given you two examples there, but I could blether on about things that we have to change to make things better and how difficult that is. And that's why when we say integrated care community, the biggest thing we'll be looking for once we, once we start building these is connections with our community. Um, another example I got, actually you're not gonna be able to stop me now. Somebody's gonna wrench this away from me. Um, a community um, a manager in a community center just sent me an email the other day and said, look, I want to do something for people with COPD. We had a trial here and it stopped. And it was great when it was going. It got people to come along, because people with CBD, they get isolated at home. They can't get out, they have cough, they have wheeze. And they'd run a little um, a trial at their community center, got people to come in, do exercise classes, and it all ran out of money. And she said, is there any way we can join with these integrated care communities and get something going in our place? That was Upper Bean Kirk in Carlisle. And we in Carlisle will need those sorts of things, and that's why I sent an email to the leader of the ICC in urban Carlisle and I said you need to meet this lady we need to have a chat about how this can be part of the solution we need to work with the um, voluntary sector we need to work with our social care uh, and we need to work with community leaders and we need to sit down and say how can this be better anyway I'm going to give this back <laughs> well that was fairly amazing I think in, in terms of obviously advocates for what um, integrated care communities is all about. You've obviously got great people in the room to do that. What I'm really anxious to do though is to make sure that people don't leave this saying, I didn't have a chance to talk about maternity and children. So can we come back to both that and the, the, the kind of community beds uh, issue if, if we haven't kind of exhausted that yet? Um, I can't believe that you're not going to ask a question because you were, I had my eye on you in terms of either children's or maternity. So has anybody else warmed up to either of those other topics yet and want to ask a question about those? Excellent. I'll come back to you now. You've lost your chance, look. Is that all right? I'll come back to you. If, if the closure at Whitton Hospital does happen and the beds do go, what's going to happen with the building and what is going to happen with the staff there that actually work in that building? Because there's a lot of staff. Okay, so we, we're still on the... On the yeah, sorry. We, no, yeah. that's, that's, that's fine, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, I'll answer that. The, the success, if you read the document, and the, there's various other documents behind, it states that the, the, it, the, the, these buildings won't be closed. There's no, the, the actually, it says that it's not about closure of community hospitals, it's about removing beds. Uh, I know uh, Evelyn's given me... Uh, um, a dirty look there. <laughs> and uh, I know mo uh, many people believe that they're not community hospitals without the beds. I understand that. I mean, um, so, um, so the, uh, but there are many other things that operate. There are teams that work out there. There are clinics and so on. Um, um, we, it's my trust that runs them and the, the, the staff. We cannot imagine any scenario where we can, the, the staff will be making staff redundant um, in, the, in, in this situation. We've got other community hospitals, if we remove the beds, and we can maybe come on to some of the talking uh, discussions that we're having. Um, the, um, um, the, we've, you, you've seen the vacancy rates that we've got, um, the, the overall shift of the plan of moving more and more care into the community. Um, so I, I think from a staffing point of view, and this is one of the worries we have, and it's difficult enough to recruit, and in the, 
uncertainty of all this process, we know that we, it's affecting the way we can recruit. It's making it worse for us. Uh, we know that. Um, so uh, the sooner we can bring clarity to it, the better, and, and, uh, I, I think. But uh, I, I think, and I'm sure Claire Malloy, our chief, is that say exactly the same, strongly reassuring to the staff. Um, and we have, I say, on the board and the exec teams, we've never even mentioned once laying people off in, in any of these teams or anything, and oh, I wouldn't support it personally. I know, uh, it is. Uh, the whole... Yeah, um, yeah. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a still... A th I work in, I, I'm working in Wigdon Hospital at this moment in time. Yeah. Well, I'm on maternity at the moment, but I will be going back within the next month. Good. And my worry is, is that my kids and I myself live in Silleth, and for me to travel further afield is going to be really difficult. So that's your staffing issue becoming a, a, even more of an issue. And not just myself, but those people who work in Wigdon don't drive, that work in the, that hospital. You know, so it's going to be yeah. a, a, another issue for those people that, that are there that are not going to be able to travel to other, other yeah. places to, to work. I think that's an important thing to feed back into the consultation. I understand that. And uh, yeah. um, perhaps at some, uh, we've got the League of Friends here from Wigton. Uh, I'm just wondering at some point. Yeah, it sure. Might be interesting uh, to, sorry. Was that the three ladies here? <laughs> <laughs> no. We, well, for some reason, I thought you three were together. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But if, if you guys are going to talk about Wigton, let, let's, let's do a bit more um, on Wigton. I was just wondering, Evelyn, if it would be useful to, uh, or I could say it if you want, but the, the conversation we started to have, yeah. um, not in the big rooms, but sitting around smaller tables and, and about trying to find, because one of the things we're trying, we're trying to find positive ways forwards here and positive solutions. Mm. And the message about closure of community hospitals, we're quite keen to not have that as a message because that's not what we're talking we, we might repurpose them and rethink them and and, and you know think about how or the wider bed base and so on so right well we've g gathered a group together and it isn't just league of friends it's the partnership trust it's the town council it's the county council um and we're trying to find a way forward where we can have some palliative care beds some medical beds, some nursing home beds, some social care beds, all on one side. And if we could do that, we could make ourselves much more viable. Plus, we had started an arrangement with the ambulance service whereby if people had a fall or something, they could assess them and just drop them off with us rather than go as far as Carlisle, which, you know, we need a bed for that. Um, there's a lot of things that we are exploring and so we, we're not dead in the water is what no. I would like to say. Oh, we, we started a, com a good conversation. We have. Um, it's a tricky one because we, we've got to find a solution that addresses some of the issues we've got because uh, but what we're trying to do uh, in Alston, M Maryport and Wigton is to have a, a genuine completely open and transparent conversation and look at um, the, the problems we have from the wider play space. So if you went to, I'll use Mary Pox, I've been leading that, mm. and uh, Dr. Melrose who, and Claire Malloy have mm. been mm. coming to Wigton more. Um, but in Mary Pox, for example, there are uh, 200 nursing and care home beds in Mary Pox. Yeah. Um, and there are lots of extra care housing beds and there are other beds for learning disabilities and so on. So we're beginning discussions about can we repurpose the function of the community hospital around avoidance of use of other beds uh, by having rehab and reablement and working with, you know, very closely with social care colleagues and so on. So there are, we need to think a bit laterally to, to see whether there are positive solutions which will be part, yeah, as part of the consultation, can then be fed back into the, for consideration. I think the thing as well, John, is if we amalgamate and do other beds as well, you don't need n as many nurses. Well, uh, I, I, I think the future is nursing and the therapists in community. I think we're all certainly going to need more, so looking at yourself, we're going to need more nurses and therapists working in the community. There's not going to be any shortage of work um, uh, because of the 
Democrat, we go aging and, and so on. But if you actually look at the overall bed base and, and try and reduce that, the overall bed base, it gives you multiple different ways of thinking about things and ways of sustaining things more locally on a local level. Uh, because in Alston, uh, use Alston for example, Alston's got general practice, uh, community hospital, extra care housing, uh, uh, residential care home, home carers, none of whom can recruit fully. They're all very vulnerable. Pull a thread on one, you pull a thread on them all. They're all interdependent, but they're all run by separate organizations and not joined up. There must be a better solution to sustaining health and care by us all working together. So those are the conversations that are going on in, in Alston. So it's to try and have a come at it from a, see how far we can get and see whether we can, we, I'm not sure we have found a solution yet, but we've got we good conversations we're... going, uh, uh, open and honest is, conversations. Well, John, we have 14 beds with sheets on, with yeah. 14 beds without. Yeah. And they should be being used by uh, I think Possibly the county council. We, we haven't been able to staff Wigton yeah. Hospital, and 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 the people dry, looking to get the staffing is a lot of our staff there, and the sisters and so on spend an awful lot of time. Um, we spend, uh, you know, I think it's well over a million, nearly two million extra on staffing than the funding mm. that comes in. It's not for want of trying for for getting these staff. But if the, if people knew that it was safe, yeah. they may be prepared to come. I think the challenge for us together is to come up with a solution that meets the challenges that we've got. Uh, because if it's better than the one that's proposed, then I'm confident the success regime will listen to it. That's what the consultation's about. But if it, if it basically we come up with solutions that say, well, uh, that don't solve our problems, then I don't think they'll be listened to, if I'm, if I'm honest. I think we have to really put our heads together. I was just about to say, it sounds like you've got that relationship going and, and the, from what I'm hearing the partnership saying you want more dialogue not just oh, yeah, yeah. that people have come out tonight in quite small numbers you know to talk one particular issue you want to talk about a range of things that are on the agenda for, for the plan including integrated care communities which is, a, is slightly outside of the consultation I'm going to move us to this lady because she's going to take us on to something and now for something completely different I've actually come out my corner Brilliant. I've been biting my tongue but I just want to endorse what Evelyn, Evelyn here has been saying. And, and I think for me, because I'm a humanitarian, right? I think for me, if we have the right numbers of bed blocking at the Cumberland Infirmary, which I understand is on average 25 a week, beds blocked? It's, it's, it's more than probably that. more than that. Sorry? At the Cumberland Infirmary. At the Cumberland Infirmary. At the Cumberland it's Infirmary. around about 40 a week. 40 a week. Yeah of patients who are ready to go home. Yeah. But there's nowhere for them to go because the care in the community isn't there. Yeah. Well, if there's 40 beds sitting idle at Wigton, right, surely to goodness there's an opportunity there to clear some bed blocking, right, which is not too far away from Carlisle. It's not the other end of the county, so relatives can actually get there. I'm at a loss. Could, could we just... Uh, that's an interesting point, I think, about who's not on the panel who's not here, There's, there isn't a representative from the local authority. Is there a, a reason for that panel? Has anybody got a, a position that you'd kind of give us on that? Um, I can try. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I think we, we, we are, they are a key partner, clearly, and, and I think it's actually something we need to take away and reflect upon, so thank you for the suggestion. I, I think we, we've been preoccupied because these are fundamentally changes to health services. So our understanding was that, you know, first and foremost, you would want to question us about these proposed changes. But you're absolutely right. Social care is a key player. Um, and perhaps we could take that away. So that's the whole point of consultation, is you flag some things up that we haven't thought of in terms of helping you with this discussion. So thank you. In the meanwhile, because that's going to take time as well, because it's taken many years now, we've never got there with social services and social care. But in the meanwhile, there are beds there sitting idle, right, which would be cheaper beds than actually bed blocking in the Cumberland Infirmary. Stephen, not that they're part of the programme, they're just not here tonight. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, no, not, I think, it's not, they're not engaged. If oh, gosh, could, no, they're yeah. definitely engaged, yeah. yeah. 
Um, there's been so much pressure in the acute trust. So that if, if we could staff them, we probably would have them open, uh, I think. Um, but we can't staff them. Uh, and, I, I, and it's not for... You know, it, it's not a simple issue, this. It's not for... Um, uh, it's not a money issue for staffing. It's, it's actually... And it's not for want of professionalism or trying. And we've got teams of people working on it. We've got... I, I'm sure the... The, 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 the sisters on, on, uh, in charge spend a huge amount of work, time ringing around trying to stop, and they go an extra mile already, you know, coming in and working longer shifts and so on um, to try and keep the beds open. But there is a staffing crisis going on in, in Cumbria across multiple sectors, and it impacts on... on uh, um, and it's not just a success regime, it's been building for th three or four years. OK, just one... one. Okay. The staffing crisis in Cumbria, which is historical, the re recruitment and retention is historical. It is not the patient's problem. It is not their fault. It's a leadership. It's down well, to leadership. I, 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 I understand why you think that. Um, if, we, if we worked any harder on it, we, we, the, the, we, we've got teams that you, what you're basically saying is it's not just the senior teams um, issue this um, there are staffing issues in community services across the country there are staffing issues in a and &E across the country there are staffing issues in paramedics across the country in general practice across the country the whole of the NHS is, sl is slowly grinding to a, a, a recruitment crisis we've had this announcement of recruiting 5,000 uh, is it 5,000 more doctors uh, um, so um, and if there was a magic, we got our teams to list because we, 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 we wanted to know as a senior team what's been done. Uh, so we had a review recently. We got our teams to list all the things that they'd done on staffing, nurse staffing uh, for community service and community hospitals. And the list went on and on and on. We, we've got uh, links to Italy and Germany. We've, we've got um, sponsoring students, trying to every single different thing, been to multiple recruitment fairs, they've, they, uh, they've put adverts in for six weeks at a time in local newspapers, they've been around adverts for Wigton Hospital, I don't know how many times, but it must be 15, 20, 30 adverts. Um, so if it was an easy problem, we, we, we'll, be, we, we'll be cracking it. Uh, John, just, just hold there a minute, because I, I think Colleague was going to say something on the same lines. I was just going to talk about nurse staffing. Um, there has been a group that's been working between the Partnership Trust and the Acute Trust looking at nurse staffing specifically because obviously it's a, a problem across both the, those areas but also within our nursing homes in the community as well. They've, they've struggled to staff. So there is work going on. We have been looking in the Acute Trust in, acuting, uh, in attracting some more nurses in but there is a national advert going to be going out very shortly as well to try and encourage people into Cumbria. And we are looking at, um, I suppose, golden hellos, trying to attract people into, the, into these difficult areas. And the Partnership Trust are doing exactly the same. So it's not that there isn't work going on. I think historically the government um, obviously cut commissions in nurse training so there is only a finite number of nurses that are coming out, but we're looking at developing new roles and interest in introducing new um, innovative ways of, of getting our local people trained up to nurses. So we've all, in both organisations, we've brought in the assistant practitioners. They're doing their foundation degrees with the University of Central Lancashire, and they will then have the option after they've done that to step on to their nurse training. Unfortunately... This isn't a quick fix. We started the work over a year ago, um, and we just have to keep on that, that, um, that, hang, hang that on one, goal. Hang on one sec. The other thing that I'd just like to say around the, the, the bed blockers in the hospital is that it's not necessarily the right place. It's to, not necessarily, in all cases, is to send them to the community hospital. A lot of those people that are in hospital beds actually could be cared for at home if they had re-enablement re packages to care for them at home. So, we'll, you know, the local authority are working hard um, as with the partner agencies to try and increase that, that capacity as well. 
just just before you you, you do your, your your next one, there's yeah. a bloke here who's got dressed up in his best uniform, <laughs> and nobody's asked him a question yet. No, okay. I, Has anybody got a question we can ask? Can I, so can I comment on, on what that discussion Please. actually? So um, I'm from Cornwall. Uh, if you think you've got recruitment challenges up here, you, they're, they're mirrored in that sort of area. And I've been up here 22 years as a paramedic. And in 2006, we merged into the Northwest Ambulance Service. And as soon as we merged, the challenge was on to provide something called safe care closer to home. And I was involved in a national piece of work called Right School, Right Time, Right Place, where the ambulance service driver was to make sure that people were treated in the appropriate place for the condition and in a way that was commensurate with their condition. So we talk a lot, don't we, about the four-hour target in A&E as if it's a quality indicator of A&E. In fact, what it really is is a barometer of what happens before you get to A&E and then what happens when you're subsequently admitted into the hospital. And unless we break that kind of vicious circle of get to hospital, be admitted, into the community, ring again, be admitted, this is just going to carry on. And I understand what you're saying around the community beds, but I really think that for us, the key in this is to, is to break that vicious circle before a patient is actually admitted in the first place. And, and actually, Colin picked up on a point here about Pathfinder. So Pathfinder is a way that allows paramedics to determine where a patient should be, normally following a clinician-to-clinician -clinician conversation. And in the past four years, We've seen growth in our activity year on year, but we've conveyed no more patients to hospital. So the impact on bed days, length of stay, the cost implications on the acute trust and, and admissions has been almost entirely mitigated, certainly since 2013-14. But it's tip of the iceberg stuff. And if we can get into the integrated care communities and we can have clinician-to-clinician -clinician conversations about patients that, let's face it, most of them we know about, Okay, especially if, if you know, they're frail or elderly or they have a care plan. We should be able to manage patients in a much more effective way for them that allows them to have a completely better care experience than be chucked into one place. Not rocket science. No, no. Yeah. So, so access to unscheduled and emergency care in the Northwest is through two ways, really. And I'm not, GPs get a lot of unscheduled, but mostly it's 111 or 999. And we get three million calls a year. And making the decision around the clinical outcome for that patient as far forward in the process means that the impact is much more proportionate on everything that you're talking about, whether that's inpatient beds, whether it's community beds. And, and for us, the key thing for me is timely access to primary care. So that the implementation of integrated care communities is absolutely fundamental. And if you get this right, it's world-class care. So there's some work. Oh, so absolutely, on the last one, definitely. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I was just yeah, going to say, I think yeah. another player in all this, I'm sure, will be public health that's now part of the local authority's responsibility. So, again, um, so we've had your say now, so that's it. Well, just, yeah, we've done, we've, done loads, we've done loads of stuff and we've tested this and it works if you get it right. And, and you know, I wouldn't be sat here as a clinician. Trying to, trying to sort of, you know, um, support something if I didn't think it would work in exactly the same way as John said just now, so, you know. But Mark's acutely no involved, that's not a pun, with maternity <laughs> service pathways, yes. and that's part of the consultation. Anybody got any questions about that bit of the consultation? Only that it's very worrying for the poor mothers in Whitehaven who suddenly, who have unexpectedly hemorrhage or what, whatever, that they're then 
this 45 minutes to get up the road, it's, I'm sorry, but, you know, excuse me, who can do it in that amount of time? And who can do it in that time when there's a lorry blocked it, like the other, um, was it Tuesday? There was, there was a, the lorry blocked it for three hours? That, mm. yeah, you know, I mean, I'm a great, great believer in paramedics. I think they're absolutely fantastic. But can you save everybody's life whilst they're being transported, baby and mother, up that road? Okay, so I, I've been a paramedic a long time, yeah. Adam. Um, I've, I've 22 years, and I've delivered about 30 babies. And all but one, I've not really had to do very much at all, because they tend to manage themselves. We're talking about quite a small number of, of acute obstetric emergencies when we look at the whole analysis. There's no doubt whatsoever there's a paramedic. I want a midwife with me or somebody that has a specialism around that episode of care, because we can deal with the basic stuff. So in terms of that transfer... I would expect to see a paramedic or a, a technician accompanied by a, an escort, um, a midwife or whoever that, you know, we're still working through, through in, in, in how that might work. Um, so I, I, I understand that and I think probably it's around the proportionality of, of risk here and the fact that the majority of patients can plan where they go. So most births are normal and I think yet there may be, it depends on what option is a patient may have to go to Carlisle or, or whatever. Um, but for that small number, um, I think we're well equipped. The other thing is, and I think what we do do quite well, is, is resilience. So if you think about, say, um, the amount of emergency preparedness that we would do as an organisation, we invest in a lot of time with the National Ambulance Resilient Unit with Joint Emergency Service Interoperability Programmes to make sure that when a, a road gets blocked or whatever, that there are alternatives. And we use very, very proactive systems that allow us to say, okay, that road's shut. What do we then have to do to realign our resources in that area to make sure that there's no impact or as minimal impact on patient care as possible? So if I can give you some assurance around what we do well, it's emergency preparedness and responding to those type of things. And I think it'll be too late, though, won't it? I mean, it's only going to take one baby and... Well, in, or one mother? Yeah, I mean, if you, if you, we've, we do transfers already, don't we? And, and we, we, I've, I've been involved in ooh, probably four major reconfiguration programs around major trauma, stroke, um, PPCI, um, and there's a number of um, hospital reconfigurations where EDs have become urgent care. So I'm talking about the Northwest now. Now, in, in response to those, we'll look at the, the number of patients that we manage, and in terms of we transfer more pa People will die in an ambulance, and people will be expected to die in an ambulance, and not everybody you can save. But what you can do is, if you look at the, the West's maternity situation, how many patients has that happened to in all the time we've been doing transfers between the two? And the answer is none. Um, you know, I, I accept that we only look at where there's an adverse incident, but we, we've looked at that and the, the answer's none. So in terms of proportional risk, I think we're pretty good on that. And I think what we also have to remember is that we are, we are already transferring women as far as Newcastle, Middlesbrough, when they're in labour already now, if we're looking for specialist special care baby cots. So... It's not like that when we're not new to this, we're already undertaking transfers further than Carlisle, in fact. Okay, um, I'm beginning to feel that, we're, that we've gone over quite a lot of ground tonight. I mean, I can try and summarize some of the issues that have come up, but um, do people feel as if they've had their opportunity to ask questions? We've, we've kind of gone into some more general stuff as well, which is good. Um, and one of my reflections will be, I, I think there's kind of, there's some more comms work you might want to do around some of the integrated care communities work. But I think, you, you got a question? Um, yes, yeah. Um, first of all, I'm not in, I don't entirely agree with the comment about it's the leadership that's at fault. Um, because I think we've had decades of struggling to get this right. And I think this team that we have here in front of us now are faced with the decades, and now you're going to have to do something about it. And, uh, and I think your enthusiasm and passion for what you're trying to do has come across tonight, so I find that very reassuring. Um, so I've been to quite a few of these engagement meetings. I'm Sue Gallagher, and I'm, I work with um, the Allerdale CCG as a lay member and asker of awkward something or other questions. That's how I've been described, but I'll try not to do that tonight. Um, so, so at some of these meetings, I felt it was quite one-sided, really. 
It felt like all of us, the public, were sitting out there saying, and this is what we want you to do. This is what we don't want you to change. This is what we do want you to change. And, and you need to get on with it. And I think I'd like to hear from each of you what we can do to support you. Now, I know you'll probably talk about lifestyles. So if you could put that to one side and think about some, some little practical things. There must be things that members of the public do and you think, I wish they just wouldn't do that because it makes the job more difficult or it costs money. And I'll give you one example of that, which is a friend who's currently having physio at the hospital for a very serious um, accident on his bicycle. There were a stack of physios there today or yesterday with no patients because people hadn't turned up. They might have had good reasons, some of them. Some of them just didn't turn up. And, and it's that kind of thing that I think we can help you with. So is, is that putting you on the spot? <laughs> <laughs> what can we do? Are you guys happy to take that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. One at a time, creeping death. Yeah. Um, there's, a, uh, there's, there's a number of us here, I think, who have been trainers for a long time, GP trainers, so we teach GPs, young GPs, and one of the things you teach them is that when you go into the consultation, it's a meeting of experts. You might be a medical expert and so on, but the person is an expert in them, the family, the communities, what worries them, what concerns them, and so on. So the approach we're trying to do um, 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 is to have that sort of discussion where we're meeting people who are experts in their own community, they know what, you know, everything there is to know about their community, all the resources, assets and so on, and work together. And I think if we do that, and we then, and in a really honest, you can't, uh, you know, it's got to be part, in a partnership, we're much more likely to get long-term sustainable better solutions than we do if we do it just from this side of the table, if you see what I mean. So my request would be to, that when we, when we are beginning this process, when we are doing, um, to do more of that, because a platform speaking at people doesn't work really for me. It doesn't work at all, to be honest. It's much better, you have the much better conversations when you, when you actually are open and honest and, and work, work and then listen if you see what I mean. So I think one of the challenges for the success regime and the consultation process is to listen really, really carefully because there might be really good answers that come as part of the consultation coming back. So I've got one. I'm going to be really practical here. It's flu season. I would ask that everybody goes and gets their flu jab if they're eligible for it and get their children to have the flu jab as well because that will reduce hospital admissions over the winter period and help us. Just, just practically, what would, what would happen? What, what would happen if everybody, if, if we all did that and we all behaved ourselves, what would happen? Well, we would have herd immunity. And actually, this is more Clive's field as the microbiologist. But I mean, in terms of what, what impact it will make on the system, I suppose. Pinched my, my thing. I think there is something about um, vaccination. I know washing your hands when you're visiting people in hospital. Um, we were crippled a couple of years ago with a severe norovirus outbreak. Part of that was actually people brought it into the community. I think within an organisation, being leaders and advocates, because we hear people who... I don't want to have the flu vaccine, I don't want to wash my hands. But actually, people say, well, actually, do it, because they often hear it better from their colleagues and, and people who they're with rather than from a professional. Um, so I think there's probably other things as well. One of the things we're concerned around is safety and quality within hospitals. It's falls at home. Well, actually, is there something that can be done in the community about that? That's a, a lot of admissions to orthopaedic hospital, orthopaedics and things. There's issues around pressure also is it coming from the community as well. Is there anything more we can be doing about that in, 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 in vulnerable el elderly relatives? So I'm sure there's absolutely a huge amount we could do. I'd like to ask people to... Um, it's, it's on the same theme, I think, as John was talking about, where we're partners um, with patients in individual consultations but we also need to be partners with our patients and communities in the design of services. And it's something that we haven't been very good at up until now. And that doesn't necessarily mean joining a group. It may be just giving your feedback when things don't go right 
or your feedback when things go well, or your ideas about how we might improve services, because we haven't got all the answers, we know we haven't got all the answers, and you are the experts in terms of what it feels like to be on the receiving end. So I would beg you all to speak up, give your ideas and suggestions, tell us when things don't go right, because it's only by giving us that feedback that we will be able to improve, and we would like to design the services with you. Can I just check? If we write something, do you read it? We put it in a box. Yeah. The, the suggestion box. Yeah. With the chewing gum and the paper clips <laughs> and everything else that's in Absolutely. there. Absolutely. This you... lady here goes through it all in terms of patient so experience. We have um, a dedicated patient experience team, and every ward gets their feedback twice a month on good and bad. And I read every one of those reports and pick up on it. And, I'm, and when there's the bad comments, I'm the, the person that's going to that ward and saying, what are you doing about it? How can we improve? We've got the You Said We Did boards on all of our wards where we pick out some of those comments, the bad comments, or the things that people say we could do better, and we try and action that, and we put that feedback on the wards as well so that people can see that we are trying to listen and we are trying to improve and, things. And the Trust Board gets all this information as yes. well. We're not ideal. I'm not saying we're perfect. There will be things that we've done wrong and you tell us time and time again and we don't change it. But we are trying really hard, so please keep telling us. Please keep coming up with the ideas. And there are ways in which people can act collectively. I mean, you guys are from the League of Friends and you're, you're acting collectively, aren't you? And you're in dialogue with these guys about Wigton. Um. <laughs> right. Okay. Again, acting even more collectively then. A um, couple more from here, and then I think a couple more questions, and I'll try and draw it to a close. Yeah, so uh, interesting comment there around lifestyle. So I sit at 53 and 105 kilos with a love of red wine. I'm not going to talk about lifestyle. So um, <laughs> what, I, what I would say is that um, when you access either emergency or unscheduled care through our normal 999 or 111 numbers, you, you will often be given advice about what the most appropriate service, service is for you. And I'd ask that you adhere to that advice, really, because I think what we're seeing is that patients are being advised to do A and maybe either not or presenting in somewhere which maybe isn't the place where we've recommended. Uh, and that if paramedics assess a patient and, and recommend an alternative pathway of care, don't always assume that if you ring 999 it's going to be the emergency department, because actually 4 in 10 isn't, so, and I'd like it to be more. So it's just really around. Uh, somebody said, to, I, went, I did a master's of oh, no, 10, 12 years ago around advanced healthcare. And the <coughs> first thing that I used to talk about, inappropriate people calling 999. Well, no 999 calls inappropriate. It isn't, because at that time, you're asking for advice. What's inappropriate is the advice we give being wrong or us responding in a different way. So it's just about, it's a partnership, isn't it? So that's all I would ask, really, in, in that context. Stephen? I'd just say that's the best question I've ever had at a consultation event, and I've sat at many, so thank you, Sue. <laughs> um, it, it does strike me that, fundamentally, the model of care that we're used to today hasn't changed an awful lot since 1948 when the NHS was introduced. And I do find myself spending a lot of time with groups of patients and members of the public um, where we're trying to, general mood, is to almost defend an outdated model of care. And I would love it if the public were putting more pressure on me in the NHS to modernise services, not defend something that's probably as I say, outdated, because just about every other facet of society has moved on so much in that time. Um, and I think about the younger generations that are coming through, not many represented here tonight, and you look at how they live their lives and really what they will expect healthcare to do for them um, when they need it. And I think it will look vastly different to what it is today. So what I would really love is for the public to be putting an awful lot more pressure on me and my colleagues to speed up the modernization of, of healthcare services for you. Okay, and of, of course, we are the NHS, so you guys, you know, I think it was only Clive who said, I'll make sure I kind of 
model this behavior and you know it's me who needs to wash my hands as long as everybody it's not just you guys who need to wash your hands it's everybody so i think we're all in this together kind of thing final uh, final question i think unless anybody thinks that we haven't touched something particularly and we'll certainly handle that but I just want to say it's, it's actually um, food for my soul hearing you say that you want to work in a co-productive way. Um, and I am getting the vibes that it is, it is genuine, right? And many of our work in the past has been tokenistic around Cumbria. Um, in another life, I work with NHS England on co-production working. And I have tried to get people interested in the ABCD model in Cumbria, the asset-based community development. And we, years ago we played at it and it never got off the ground. But I think now if we're looking for new opportunities and new ways forward to sustainability, if we can actually genuinely work with the third sector who are our eyes and ears on the ground, as well as service users, carers and patient and carer groups, we're working around the same table in the planning process, right, in an adult way, because it can be managed. Um, and you would actually learn an awful lot from that, but so would the public. And then the public can go back into their own communities, because I think really the NHS is a victim of its own success over the years, but we are in a state now, and we do have to have that change. But this is the, this is, a once in a lifetime opportunity to get co-production working with the asset-based community development model. But please don't just talk about it, make it happen. Thank you. And by the way, that stuff's really fun to do. Final question here. It, it, it's a very last one. Go on then. It's for the success regime, right? The forms that we're all supposed to be filling in, are the success regime going to accept the Cumberland News forms that people are signing or the town council cards that are being mm. given out in Wickton, will they be taken into consideration or are they all to be from this document? Stephen, have you got an answer to that? We, we, we welcome your feedback in any shape or form, whatever the piece of paper, be it Promise. electronic. So yes, we would read them all and take them all most seriously. We, we only offer a format for those people that might want something you know, printed, but it doesn't matter how it comes in, we will receive it willingly. Lovely, thank you. Stephen, there's going to be uh, an independent organisation that's assessing all the information that comes in. Yes, so, indeed. So they, they will just take that information in whatever form it comes. Absolutely. Yeah, let's make them earn their money. All sorts of formats, please. That'd be great. <clears throat> okay. Last chance. Anybody got a final question? I've been, like I say, I've been on maternity leave now, so I've, I've just heard over the last couple of days that the children's services within this area are slowly declining down. The health visitors are getting reduced. Um, so what's, what, what is happening in, within that area? Because it's not looking good for the children within our, our area in the schools. The, yeah, the school nurses, they're not even, you know... Up to, for about two years now, there's been no recruitment for school nurses either. So what, what is happening with, the, with children's services? Okay, both of those are, are, are one of the other partners' responsibility, aren't they? They're local authority responsibility. Yeah. So but I'll try you... and answer that. Uh, the, the, those services are within my trust remit, and, um, or our trust remit. Uh, um, they, uh, they're not part of the success rate. What you were talking about were universal children's services and school nursing health visiting. Not part of this consultation, so, but it's separate, and there's a separate process going on. Um, the commissioning for those services changed when PCTs were one of the reorganised, uh, um, changed into, uh, evolved into CCGs. The commissioning for those services went to the county council and the public health, led by the public health department, who have been doing a review and bringing together a lot of these process, um, uh, functions into a 0 to 19 policy, uh, which they are as, uh, putting out to re recommission. And the proposals will, are likely to suggest changes to health visiting and district nurse roles, uh, sorry, uh, school nursing roles. Um, so it's a commissioning-led, county council-led change to the 0 to 19 service that we have to respond to and uh, to deliver the, the change of services. 
Okay, just, just to kind of wrap up, and maybe we'll come back to that point at the end, actually, about our friends and the local authority. So, so I, I think kind of where we started off, we, we started to talk about some of the issues that are big system issues like PFI, like recruitment crises that are, are happening across the country. And obviously that's something that is felt acutely here, but it's felt across the whole country. And, and that point that I think we were talking earlier about getting involved and making our concerns known about those kind of things are things that we would have to do as a, as a citizen generally. So I think there's a kind of theme there. Uh, there were the issue to do with um, uh, the ICC, and I think what colleagues were talking passionately about that, and you could, you could feel the interest in the room, and clearly it would seem that it makes sense to, to mount a particular kind of comms plan, communication plan around how that plan is looking to, to roll out and what it means to everybody because I think people kind of get that but there's a story that needs to be told and a much more kind of convincing story about the funding of it for example uh, and then I think as I say uh, we've, we've heard about a lot of things that relate to one of the partners who, who, who's not here and I think that's something that maybe the panel and the program need to reflect on in terms of there's clearly an impact on the local authority around some of the changes that are proposed and they're the commissioners of some of those services that, that kind of sit around this program, like public health services. Um, finally, I think it's really interesting to hear someone talk about co-production and, and A, B, C, D, but perhaps more interestingly, there's a group of people from a community here who want to get involved in making things better in their community. And obviously, you guys came out tonight, and that's part of what you want to do as well. But clearly, the only way we're going to make this better, given that there's not the resources there that there was, and it's only going to get worse, is that if we do stuff ourselves. So please stay involved. Please tell your friends that this wasn't a horrendously painful exercise. Well, it probably was for these guys, but um, please fill in the consultation form. Please take part in any, anything else like this to help give these guys as much information as you can. Is there any more kind of closing statements you want to make? Or are you, are you happy? Are you guys happy? Am I happy? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can I thank you very much for coming? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.